Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word stupid. So, no sponsor again this week. Yep, and I really don't understand why. I don't. I have noticed that every time a zombie says it wants brains, it walks right past you. OP, not you too. BG told me it's fun. Well, Jimmy boy, this should be the greatest haul in history. <laughs> Real setup, that stupid William stiffen me to that heisty and his gang, eh? Boy, oh boy, are they stupid. <laughs> uh uh-uh, there's a store right up ahead. Jules Jewelry. Now to park this thing. I'll leave it running so I can scram out of here in a hurry. What? No doorman here at Jules? <laughs> oh, well, that fire plug will do. Won't make any difference, I'll be right out. There. Now to go see Jules. How do you do? May I help you, young man? Yes, indeed, Pop. I'm getting engaged tonight. I need something extra special in the way of diamonds. You got any? Oh, yes. A very nice selection. Something in the ring, eh? Uh, just step back here. I think I can find something you like. Okay, Pop. Now, here are a few choice ones. This one is a hot... That's a comedy, man. Pop. I got a gun here, huh? Now, that's you and me. Step back into the little room. For a little chat, uh, just keep on moving. What's the meaning of this? Is this a hold Look, Jules, I know you're the fence for the Williams mob. You're in pretty deep, so don't start crying to me. Now, dig up that hall they brought in today and be quick. I want to borrow it. I'm warning you, you'll be caught. Cut the stalling. Okay. Here they are, just under this table. Now, take them. And this too, you stupid... Oh! You're a little too old to try that, Jules. That tap on the head will hold you for a good long time. Tata, man. Thanks for the loan. Uh, oh, excuse me, lady. Sorry, I bumped you. I'm rushing to get married, you know. Now, that, Jerry, me boy, was a sweet job. Another 15 minutes and I'll be past the city limits. <laughs> ah, no, they're not looking for me. I've been speeding. Hey, yeah, maybe they are. Nothing went wrong back there, did it? Oh, no. No, it couldn't have. Now's no time to get panicked. Not with 15 grand in those little rocks. I guess I'd better pull over. Hey, mister. You own this car? Your name Jerome Smith? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. What's up? We got orders to delay you. You got a date with homicide for the murder of Jules Buck. I hope you knew him. <laughs> In just a moment, the conclusion of our story. But first... Boy, oh boy, was he stupid. Agreed. But he has nothing on you. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I was hoping for a battle of wits. But you appear not to be armed. Okay, BG. I'm ready. What you got? Well... You're so stupid that you thought Boys Two Men was a daycare center. Ouch. You're so dumb that you thought Meow Mix was a playlist for cats. Okay, now. You're so stupid you sat on the TV and watched the couch. Okay, BG. I think we got it. I have more. And now, back to our story. That's all this about murder and homicide. Well, we got an all-car call. Seems some guy bumped into a dame outside this jewel's jewelry. It was past six when he was usually closed, and she figured something was funny, so she goes in and finds this Jules dead. Knocked over the head a little too hard. She calls the cops, and they come over. 
This dame saw you jump into the car, and she described you good. But what caught you was funny. And five, ten minutes before that, this same squad car crew gave your car a ticket for being parked in front of a hydrant with the motor running. And you're going to pay a lot for breaking the parking laws. <laughs> Okay, that wasn't any kind of mystery at all. Wrong. Do I have to point out, again, that these five-minute bits never are? One has to wonder why people love them. Wrong. You're so ludicrous you left me a voicemail by screaming into my mailbox. I really thought that one would work. Is that you say? Hello, and a very warm welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. On today's show, we are thrilled to bring back a popular segment of These Are Your Stories. This segment features a collection of fascinating Bigfoot tales that left a lasting impression on me and you, the listeners. They aired on episode number 418 back in January of 2020. The reviews were overwhelmingly positive. In addition to the Bigfoot tales, we have a special treat for you today. I've discovered a lost episode of the classic OTR series, Dimension X. While it may not have been entirely lost, at least it's new to me, and I'm sure it will be a delight for you. To kick off the show... I'll be delving into a review of an exclusive Audible audiobook titled Trapdoor. I've got to tell you, this one came as a complete surprise to me, and I can't wait to share it with you. So, if you're ready to embark on a captivating journey filled with mystery, intrigue, and a touch of the supernatural, then let's get started. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. This week, we're going to take a look at the new Audible original, Trap Door by J.P. Pomeri. One of the things I like about Audible is the fact that you can try thousands of books in their Plus catalog for free with your premium account. It allows me to try books that I would have otherwise ignored. Trapdoor is one of these. So what is this one about? Ava wakes up in a dark cellar with no memory of how she got there. Imprisoned with her, seemingly at random, are four men. The only way out is the trapdoor in the ceiling, and it's locked. Here's a clip from the beginning of the book. Ava. Her mouth is dry, and a drop sore is spinning in her brain. She can barely open her eyes, and when she does, there is only darkness. What happened last night? It's Friday? Or is it Saturday? Why doesn't she know what day it is? She squeezes her eyes tightly closed, bracing herself against the headache and the vague nausea in her gut. It must be Friday morning, so why the hangover? Did she drink too much beer last night? Did she drink any beer last night? No, she wasn't drinking. No drinks for a week now. Maybe the sleeping pills? No, there haven't been sleeping pills either. Seven days. Seven long days. This isn't a hangover. This is what it's like now. At 27, she wakes up with some obscure unexplained pain and grogginess. And, of course, that familiar cold emptiness, like a weight on her chest. Another day, she reminds herself, bringing her hand to her face, rubbing away the sleep from the corners of her eyes, pinching the chapped skin of her bottom lip. Just another day. She is at home, in bed. Leon is beside her. She could have sworn he was just touching her face. 
No, of course he wasn't. He's not here. The mattress is concrete, cool and flat. No wonder everything aches. Her hips, her shoulders. Did she sleepwalk to the garage? What the hell happened? She reaches out, but she doesn't find her husband. She finds the gritty texture of a brick wall. Wherever she is, it's almost completely dark, with just a dim glow from somewhere in the corner. Touching her arm, running her hand down her stomach, she recognises the fuzzy texture of her flannelette pyjamas. So she did go to bed, or had been planning to. Had she laid down in the concrete of her garage and slept there? Where am I? She thinks about what she knows happened last night. A meeting the same meeting she's been to at least once a week for the past four weeks. Her mum gave her a lift home, so she had been at home. It had been a normal night. It occurs to her now that she doesn't even know what time it is. Exhaling and tensing everything inside, she sits up. Her head feels heavy, a cinder block on her aching neck. Her phone must be nearby. She blinks several times, trying to clear the fog from her mind, but it's as if her thoughts are wrapped in a thick veil, the panic rising as the fog begins to lift. Leon? She calls tentatively into the dark. No, of course Leon isn't here. Had she dreamt of him? It wouldn't be the first time. She thinks of Taj and feels even emptier. Her phone isn't there when she reaches for it. She finds nothing but concrete, like a sheet of ice beneath her. And she's thirsty. What she wouldn't give for a glass of water. The air is thick and musty. She can make out only vague, amoebic shapes in the near-perfect darkness. Hello? She says. Okay, that clip gives you an idea of the quality of the narration, but not the full story. There are five of them locked in this room. The single clue about what brings them all here is the cryptic message sprayed onto one wall. It reads, Connect the dots. Repent. A camera is fixed high above them and is live-streaming the whole nightmare to the world. The question is, What confessions are they meant to make to their unseen audience? With only a single lighter between them and the cellar steadily filling with water, Ava races to discover what connects her to these four men. But nobody here is who they claim to be. And in this dark place, secret and lies are so much easier to tell than the truth that could set them all free. I thoroughly enjoyed this story. The way it slowly panned out kept my mind spinning and I really didn't see the ultimate twist until literally a second before the characters spoke it. As I mentioned, the narration is really good and the voiceover fits the mood perfectly. I will warn you that there is adult content in this one, so not one for the kids. Overall, I loved this. The suspense was tight, narration was unobtrusive, and the story was surprisingly realistic. Definitely worth your time. Now, if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash runs amazing stories, and you can have Trapdoor for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out the service. You can stream or download thousands of included audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible originals in the Plus catalog. There is so much to do that you will never run out of material. So, to download your free audiobook today... Go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Trapdoor is going to keep you guessing. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. 
These are your stories sent by you for you. This time we feature stories about Bigfoot. Our first one comes to us via Pennsylvania from Jake Waters. I read this one exactly as it was sent to me. Hello Ron, I have a fishing story for you and I hope you can use it on the show. It's a real encounter with Bigfoot and I have to say it changed how I feel about them things. I can add more depth and character names if you want. I'm fishing at the Cadigan. It's on the Allegheny River in western Pennsylvania. So I park at the top of the ramp going down to the river. Not a boat ramp, just one of those for back and four-wheel drives down to the water. I go up and it's getting to be about twilight when I hear something coming down the hillside across from us. It's steep, but not too steep. Anyway, I hear it barreling down the hillside, but the brush is so thick and really high, better part of 12 feet. Now, I'm waiting for a black bear to hop onto the road, but it doesn't. It just stops in the middle of the last bush right beside the road. Thinking it was still a bear, I go ushering my friend and his four-year-old daughter back down to the river. There's a bunch of rocks down there from baseball to basketball size so they can defend themselves. I'm still up at the car because I'm less than five feet from my door and the brush is a good 30 feet away, so I know I can make it to my car and distract them with my horn. Yet, it never leaves the brush. It just shakes it violently. I stand there for about five minutes and I can see it's making its way back up the hill. What I didn't realize was that it was pushing trees around it. About 20 feet tall they were. I'm pretty sure I wasn't connecting anything because of my adrenaline. I never seen it. It was too dark by that point. I walk back down to the river and we're gathering our stuff. It's getting way too creepy. We were packing up and I hear a knocking coming from the hillside. I could see a group of people down river, but they weren't near any trees. They were actually on an outcrop about 20 feet away from the tree line. The knocking was above us and slightly upriver. And even if they had reacted to it, looking around and whatnot, I decided to yell to them about the possibility of there being a bear. They said that they had heard something coming down the hillside and seen my buddy running towards the water. They thanked us for the heads up. As soon as they thanked us, a rock came flying off the hillside in between us and them. We actually seen it hit the water. They jumped as I did, because we weren't really expecting it. I turned around to see if my friend was up the hill and was just messing with us. As I turned, I saw that he was just a few feet behind me holding his daughter. Both were as white as a ghost. I guess none of us were expecting that. I decided to reach down and grab a rock and carried it with me just in case it got real. Three more times we heard these rocks hitting the water, and I had had enough. Our site was all cleaned up, and I took it as a perfect time to retaliate. Not my best decision. I knew where the rocks were being thrown from. That darn bush up there. So, I chucked it. I knew there weren't any trees around, so I figured if I threw it, it'd probably just blow right through. But it didn't. It made a thud sound, like it hit someone on their chest. And then that darn rock rolled right back towards me. I actually heard whatever I hit get the wind knocked out of it. Then the thing takes off down the road towards the other group. They started screaming, and I mean being threatened with other terror kind of scream, and start throwing whatever they could grab at it. I'm just standing there bewildered and watching them scatter. A few went into the water, and the rest ran towards me. All of a sudden, I hear one of them yell, Get in the truck! Now they took off to their truck, and I mean when I say they left everything, nobody grabbed anything, and they took off. I'll never forget their screams. I ran back up the hill and humped in my car. My buddy ran up with his daughter right after they started shouting. He was crying. 
Now, I've known this man for 20 years, and I can count on one hand how many times I've seen him cry. I started up my car, and we hot-tailed it out of there. I never seen what it was, but I put everything together later that night. It's been five years since it happened, and I absolutely refuse to ever go back down there. It's a damn shame, too, because it's a great catfishing spot. Jake Waters from Pennsylvania. Jake, that has to be one of the coolest Bigfoot stories we've ever had on the show. As I've said before, I have a fondness for these type of stories, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And by the way, I don't think it needs any more depth. You are an amazing storyteller. Our next Bigfoot story comes from my own backyard. It was sent in by Rich Snyder, who lives in Pasco, Washington. Rich writes, Hey Ron, I heard you talking about Bigfoot, and I have a story that took place a few years ago. We were out in the Pinchot National Forest. I was with a small group of friends, and all of us experienced what I'm about to tell you. On June 22, 2009, we were driving on a curvy road off Highway 14 when a large humanoid walked out of the forest. I swerved to miss it and glanced back in my rearview mirror and saw someone or something darting back into the forest. A moment later, we stopped and turned around and got a three to four second glimpse of something walking on two feet about 50 feet away. He was about seven or eight foot tall, covered with black hair and possessing broad muscular shoulders. A moment later, we all heard a scream that came from the area where it had disappeared. I felt nervous, confused, and excited all at the same time. Up until this point, I thought Bigfoot to be much ado about nothing. Today, I am a believer. Rich Schneider, Pasco, Washington. Thank you, Rich. I know the area that you spoke of, and that place is Bigfoot Central. I've heard many credible stories like yours come from that area. One from a close friend who experienced nearly word for word your story. There just has to be something to all of this. There just has to be. Our last Bigfoot story comes from Lowell Rice. He writes to us from Gresham, Oregon. Hello, Ron. Here's a story that happened a few summers ago. The year was 1963. I had to go to California with my family. I didn't want to go, but I didn't have a choice. My uncle rented us a cabin at Big Bear Lake for a week as a family Christmas present. On our last night at Big Bear, my aunt took my mother, my sister, and me to the movies in town. The movie was over around 5 p.m., and we headed back to the cabin. Once we arrived, I realized I didn't have my wallet. I asked my aunt to drive me back to the movie theater, and she refused to take me. So I decided to walk to town to see if I could find my wallet. When I arrived at the movie theater, I asked the girl at the ticket booth if I could go look for my wallet. She gave me permission to enter the theater to look, and to my surprise... I found it stuck in the seat. When I came back outside, it was dark. Something I didn't think of when I left the cabin. There was only one way back, so off I went. It was a gravel road that ran up the side of the mountain. I was walking along and I started to hear something moving on my left. It was the sound of branches snapping when you step on them. The terrain on the right side of the road was a steep hill upward, with a lot of thick trees and underbrush. On the left side of the road was a steep angle going down. There weren't any trees, but a lot of bushes and underbrush. It would be very hard for a human to climb without slipping. That was where the sound was coming from. When I stopped, they would stop. When I started to walk again, the branches started snapping again. As kids, we always carried stones in our pockets, in case we ran into trouble. I started to lob them into the air so that they would fall on whatever was down there. Then the breaking of the branches became more ominous. When I stopped to listen this time, the thing just kept coming up the side. 
The road went off to the right about twenty yards ahead of me. At the speed this thing was moving, I wouldn't make it to the bend. I told myself, there's no way I'm going to let this thing get by me. I started to run. God must have been with me because a car came around the bend. I stood right in the middle of the road doing jumping jacks. It slammed on its brakes and stopped with only a foot to spare. My aunt was driving with my mother and sister in the car. They had come looking for me. I ran to the side of the car, got in and said, Let's go! As we drove away, I looked out the back window and I saw a large creature, which had to be seven feet tall, standing in the middle of the road. I didn't tell anyone about this at that time because I was too shook up. My sister knew something was wrong just by the look on my face. I didn't tell my sister the whole story until we got back home to Oregon. Lowell Rice, Gresham, Oregon. What a great story, Lowell. I have to say, to go through that as a kid would be tough. Thank you for being part of Bigfoot Week, and thank you for your story. Our featured story is a good one. I found this in an archive of OTR science fiction stories on the internet. I thought I'd heard all of the remaining episodes of Dimension X, but I was wrong. This one had been hiding out there, and I'm so very glad to have found it. I turned it over to the Old Time Radio Researchers Group, and it has been restored to the Dimension X collection. Win-win. The story is a little bit about space sickness, and a lot about the demise of a great race of aliens that just disappeared. It is titled The Lost Race, and it first aired in May of 1950. Enjoy! Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension XX. When man first crossed the vast distances of outer space to land on strange worlds, he found that someone had been there before him. The ruined canals of Mars, the smashed cities of Titan and Centaurus II and III, all these were evidence that 100,000 years ago, a race of intelligent beings built their cities across the galaxy. They knew space travel, atomic power, astrophysics, and engineering. And then they destroyed themselves, completely, so that of all the cities on a thousand worlds, only dust and rubble remained. Why? Why did these beings obliterate all record of themselves? That is the mystery of the lost race. <laughs> The freighter Carilia, bound out of Earth for Cetus Alpha 2, came into normal flight after 103 days in overdrive. The stars were unfamiliar. The constellations known on Earth had disappeared. But there was a yellow sun off the port, and about it revolved three planets. What do you make of it, Briggs? It isn't on any of the star charts, Captain Wharton. I checked through. One and three are dead, all right. Have to take a closer look at number two. Turn up the vision scale. Polar ice caps. She's green around the belt. Let's take her down to a five mile orbit. Swing around her for a look. Alert for deceleration. Aye, sir. Throw in the manuals. Power room. Power room, aye. We're going down to have a look at something. Give us just enough power to keep her under control. All right, Briggs. Hang on to your stomach. Sent for me, Captain Morton. Come in, Mr. Al. I... Do you mind if I sit down? Free fall sickness? Well, I'm afraid I'm not an old space hand. Oh, we'll level out in a minute. Do you want something? Yes. 
We come out of overdrive, smack in the middle of a new planetary system. Briggs says it's unreported. Well, that's rather good news, isn't it? Depends. Press report's pretty common. But we'll stake a claim on her in case there are any mineral discoveries. Well, I meant the possibility of archaeological finds. I'm afraid I'll leave that to you, Mr. Howell. You're the expert. Coming up five, Captain. Level off. Hang on, Howell. Power room. Hold her steady she goes. We'll orbit at slow cruising speed. All right. Clear the scope, Briggs. Aye, sir. Hmm, nice looking piece of real estate. Well, the space guard requires I check up for radioactives, gold, and lost race rooms. You're landing? Landing. I've got a schedule to keep, Mr. Howell. I can't sit down on every lump of dirt I run into. We'll do a spectroscope check, and I figured you'd spot any ruins. All right. Wait a minute. Hmm? There in the lower quadrant. What? That bald spot in the vegetation. Those are ruins, all right. Are you sure, Howell? Yes. I've seen the lost race rubble on Centaurus, too. There. You can see it plainly, dust and rubble. No, that's what I get for calling in an expert. Briggs, stand by to take it down to 5,000 feet. Aye, sir. All this stinking luck. There goes my schedule. Seen enough, Howell? This is going to set me back five hours. Interesting. Wait a minute. What's wrong? I don't believe it. Marvelous. Incredible. Stop sputtering, Howell. What is it? Look over that rise in the ground. It's Hmm? a section of the city still standing. Hey, you're right. That hill must have shielded it from the blast. Captain, you've got to land. Land? You've got to. This is the first lost race site that's ever been spotted, of course. You'll land. Howell, we get a $1,000 bonus for every day under par for the run. But you don't understand. It's the biggest find in the century. We can chart it, and you'll have to get back somehow. That's all. I'm not sitting down to rake over old dust heaps. Captain Wharton, I'm on commission to the space guard. You may have to answer to them. I'll think up one. Look, Howell, strictly speaking, you're a passenger. Well, you've got to land. You don't belong on the bridge. I'm not landing down there on that Briggs, emergency from the power room. Something must have blown. Power room. Power room. Stanton, what's wrong down there? Stanton. He doesn't answer. Anything serious, Captain? He reaches the fuel locker. That five pounds of ascending will go and kick us right out of space. Stanton. Stanton. Power room, I. What happened? What blew? The main tube coupling. She's secured now. What's the damage? The main tube's burnt out. The bearing, the coupling, the injector valve, and the needle gauge. Can you make repairs? Not in flight. Can you raise enough power to land? I don't know, Captain. The wiring shot. He's fat like a tomcat. I might be able to get something from the deceleration auxiliaries. Get a jury rig on her. We'll try to set her down. Aye, sir. Briggs. Yes, sir. Alert for crash landing. Signal room. Signal room. Signal, aye. Langston, get off a position fix and SOS standby. Aye, sir. Well, Mr. Howell, I guess you're going to join your friends in the lost race. I just hope it's not permanently. Leveled off now, Captain. Turn her up a point. That's it. She's bucking bad. Five more minutes and the whole plates will shake loose. Power room. Stand by for bar blast on signal. Power ready. I'm going to try for that clearing. Too narrow. Two to one for a dollar. All right. Hang on. Briggs! Briggs! Oh, you all right? I hit my head on the panel. Well, uh, I seem to be ill. all assembled. Well, we're down. Guess our luck hasn't run out yet. Calling power room. Power room, I. All right down there? Yeah, I'm all right. Danton, I want a complete damage check and repair estimate. Get up here as soon as you got it for me. Briggs, you all right now? Yes, sir, I guess so. As soon as we get Danton's report, get a detail aft, help him with repairs. Captain Wharton. What is it, Langston? My speaker line's out. Sending circuit's blue. Spare tubes? Uh, that was a pretty rough landing, Captain. They're gone. I can't replace them this side of Luna Space Station. I see. Well, the SOS ought to do it. And the Space Guard monitor reports opposition... They aren't going to, Captain. Why not? 
Sending circuits went out when the blast went off down there. I didn't get the SOS out. Thank you, Langston. Get back and see what you can salvage. Does that mean bad news? We were in overdrive, Mr. Howell. It would take 40 years to search the distance we've traveled in one day. Consequently, when a ship doesn't make port and doesn't transmit a position fix, they forget about it. Oh. I see. And with the radio out, we blast off on our own power. Or we don't get off. I got your damage report, Captain. Well? Here. It's on a B-23 checklist. Mm. Not bad? Worse. Stanton, uh, how long will it take you for repairs? I don't know. An estimate. I know gypsy fortune teller. How about the lifeboat? For deep space? What are they teaching at Sands Point now? Basket weaving? Stanton, the lifeboat I... couldn't lift half a light year off this here mud heap. Stanton, I'll take just so much. Look. Can it be converted to Bessendium Drive? The converter links were mashed when we came down. How long is it going to take you to repair the main drive? Look, Captain, I got two hands. You want me to hold a lug wrench in my teeth? See here, Captain. You I... see here, Captain. The whole lousy crew's been spitting all over me ever since we blasted off. Now you can all wait on me. Who do you think you are, Denton? The only power man on this ship, that's who. You ain't satisfied with the way I'm working, go hire yourself another boy. The woods are lousy with him. I'll take my own sweet time. What's the matter with him? Got a bug in his ear? Space fatigue, Captain. He's been locked up in the power room four days. Well, we don't have enough trouble. Briggs, remind me to slug the psychotechnician when we get back. Don't tell me nobody gets into deep space who isn't emotionally stable. What are you going to do about him, Captain? Nothing. Stay off his back. Oh, but you can't... Captain's the only man who can get us out of here. We want to hit the cradle at New York spaceport again. We've got to keep him happy. Captain Wharton, as long as we're landed and we do have to wait for the engines to be fixed, I suppose we can explore the lost race ruins. I'm particularly... Look, Mr. Howell, I can't spare the men. We are now stuck tight. Until Danton gets those engines fixed. And if he can't, which is entirely possible, we are stuck, period. Oh. Oh. Briggs, I want you to keep a careful eye on the men. Space fatigue is nothing compared to what we might run up against now. Captain Wharton. Captain, I've got it. Is any circuits? No, uh, no, sir, but I picked up the incoming video band. Well, that's something. Uh, can you get the mail call through? The men could use a little lift right now. Well, the scheduled one-way personals are due at 2330 Greenwich. Good. That ought to help morale. Langston, uh, rig the receiving booth. Aye, sir. Howell, this is a break. Seeing the folks at home may be enough to keep everybody on an even keel. I know I'll be glad to see that kid of mine. Mr. Langston, get Hanson out of the booth. You wear the glass right off the tube. Ah, take it easy, Williams. Everybody gets three minutes. Hey, Kelly, I bet that dame of yours burned up the circuits, huh? How'd you know it was his girl? You can't tell through the booth. <laughs> well, who else would call that ape? What'd you say, mm. Kelly? Oh, nothing. She don't have to. She just stands in front of the pickup tube and... Oh, brother! <laughs> <laughs> I can just see that. Hey, hey, it's a boy! A boy! Alice had a boy! What? They're gonna show him to me in the circuit tomorrow. Congratulations! <laughs> Who's next, Mr. Langston? Uh, the last call's coming through now on ticker. It's for Williams. Well, hey, wait a minute, Williams. Well, let go of my arm. What happened to my call? Uh, no call today, Dan. You're a liar, Langston. Hey. My girl calls in every scheduled circuit. That must be mine. Let go, Dad. Maybe Janie was busy waiting tables in the lunchroom. What do you know about her, Hanson? You kidding? She's a swell kid. Everybody at New York Spaceport knows her. Yeah, I've yeah. seen you hanging around Jane, too. Now, wait a minute, Danton. Take it easy, Danton. You and Williams made this up between you, didn't you? You're going to take my call, huh, William? You're space happy. You used to hang around with her before I cut you out. Now listen, Danton, you were lucky enough to get her. Let well enough alone. You bet I got her, all right, and you're not going to steal her back. Williams, I'm going to... Are you crazy? Danton! Get him off! Oh, lion. Get him off! Hey, what's what's going on in here? Let him fight! I'm going to kill you, you double crush him! Behind my back! Grab him, Hanson, get his arm! Oh, me! Nobody took your call. Calm down, Dad. Right I'll fix all of you. Look out. He's got a wrench. Hanson! <laughs> He's nuts! Ah, uh, nobody gets a call. Nobody. How do you like that, Williams? You ain't gonna hear from Janie no more. How do you like that? After him! Kelly! 
Hanson! The airlock. He's left the ship. Let him go, the jealous screwball. Sure. But that's the only man who can get us off of here. I warned you so, help me, Briggs. I warned you to keep an eye on Damp. Well, I didn't think he'd go off this way. Well, it's that girl of his, sir. He's crazy jealous about her. Any reason for it, Williams? No, sir. She's a good kid. Too good for Danton. I guess he's just so afraid of losing her to some other guy, he, he's getting psychopathic about it. Well, we've got to get him back. I want every man equipped and ready for search parties immediately. Aye, sir. Williams, rig some portable searchlights and issue hand blasters and radiation tickers. Kelly. Aye, sir. You had the second party. If you find Danton, send up a signal flare. Aye, sir. Unless we do find him, we'll be on this planet until the next freighter stumbles on us. Maybe 10,000 years from now. <laughs> that light up, Hanson. This is amazing, Captain. Lost Ray's building's actually standing. Hey! What is it? Oh, it's nothing. A shadow. This place gives me the willies. To be able to find out so much about them, their science, art, what they looked like, perhaps even why they destroyed themselves. I'm beginning to wonder about that, Howell. You sure they destroyed themselves? Maybe they lost a war to another race. Uh, the winners would have left traces. Genghis Khan, the Mongol emperor, left a pile of skulls as a monument after he destroyed his enemies. But there's been nothing like that found. No clues at all, Nothing. Eh? When they decided to wipe themselves out, they did a thorough job. But why? That's what we've been asking for 50 years. They wanted to end like that. Captain, there's a rise ahead. Keep going. Anything on your side, Briggs? No, sir. Hanson, what is it? I don't know, sir. It's a funny kind of a glow. I guess I shot without thinking. Don't get trigger happy. Howell. Yes? Where do you think the light is coming from? Down there. It's an amphitheater. Stone seats and a hood. It looks like a band shell. What's up, Captain? Wait a minute. Well, Howell? I don't know. That's the lost race sign on the hood. The what? A sort of hieroglyphic. Only thing we'd ever found before. One in each ruin. What does it mean? Some kind of a warning, I think. Come on. We're going down there. Careful now. There's a platform of some kind down there. Looks like a lecture platform, doesn't it? Or an altar. This might have been a temple. Perhaps the Lost Race sign had a religious significance. It looks like a throne to me. A throne five feet high. Briggs, climb up there. And see if there are any controls for this machinery. Hi, sir. Well, this wasn't meant for any man to sit on. There's a lever up here. Shall I try it? Sure, go ahead. Hey, what the... What's that mist? It's like a steam bath. I wonder if Kelly and Williams ran into hey, anything Kelly, like... hold that light up. Shut up and keep looking for Danton. What? Look there. In the hood. It's Williams and Kelly. That crazy jet jockey... When I find Please, him, I'm going to beat his brains out. You could see him, a three-dimensional image. Some kind of television. Get down, Briggs. Hi, sir. Did you see it, Skipper? I was just thinking about him, and there he was. And we all saw it. Out of the way. I'm going to try it. This thing can pick up Earth. It'll replace the receiver. Danton smashed. Just throw the lever, eh? <laughs> reaches Earth, all right. What? Imagine. Television without a transmitter. Looks like the lost race was ahead of us in more ways than one. Go up and try it, Howell. It's amazing, amazing. Television without a transmitter. This, this machine may be the clue to the mystery of the lost race. I'll try it. Mary... I've told you I like my paper first in the morning. Oh. If that youngster wants to know how the tigers did, let him wait until I am... My father in Detroit. Remarkable, Captain. You can see the whole room clearly. Say, how about me, Captain? Let me get up there. I'd like to see my baby. Alice told me all about... Oh. What's the matter, Hanson? 
I kicked something, a wrench. Well, hold it up. What? It's Danton's. That means he's been here. We're on his trail, all right. Come on, Hal, let's go. No, but the baby wouldn't take a minute, Captain. Later, Just... Hanson. We've got to find Danton first. All right, now, let's get moving. Hold it. What's that? The recall flare. Kelly and his men have found Danton. Oh, I hope that crazy fool is in one piece. We start back now, Captain. Yes. That came from the ship. Another flare? No, that was an explosion. That's all we need now. Something more to happen to the ship. Oh, it's the main jets. Smashed flat. Of all the sleeping rot. Check through the ship for further damage. Aye, sir. Oh, look at those plates. Crumpled like an accordion. Captain! Oh, Captain! Here comes Kelly's party. We got him. We got Danton. Hold it. What happened here? Somebody blew up the main jets. Danton, do you know anything about this? No, sir. Not much, he doesn't. He's crazy enough to blow us all up. Listen, Hanson, I admit I went off my head tonight, but I'm not crazy enough to commit suicide. The jets are smashed. We're all marooned up the same creek. I still think he's got something to do with it. Lay off, Hanson. We found him wandering up in the hills. And he was with us when the blast went off. Yes, that's right. We saw your recall flare before the explosions. Oh, I guess that puts Stanton on the clear. Well, then who did it, Captain? I don't know, how. Looks like somebody didn't want us to leave this planet. Well, we still got one slim chance left. If we can repair the lifeboat... Skipper, it's gone. Gone? The escape port is open. The boat's missing. What? Oh, what else? The arms chest was cleaned out, sir, and the fuel locker was jimmied open. The descendium bars are gone. You sure? You look for yourself, sir. She's clean. I see. There's only one answer left. There's something or somebody out in those ruins trying to get us. Maybe that lost race decided they weren't going to stay lost. You think some of them may, may still be alive? Who else could have blown up our ship? Keep your blaster up, Hal. And be careful. It's a hair trigger. What are we doing back at the television machine, Captain? I thought we were looking for the lifeboat. We are. Whoever blew up the ship must be around here. Might as well try to use the machine to track them down. Yeah. Yeah. Catch them with their own gadget, huh? That's right. All right, Hal, you're the expert. Get up there and try to find them. I hope it works. Well? I'm trying, Captain. Nothing but mist. I don't understand it. It reached all the way to Earth before I saw my father in Detroit. Mary, my papers all rumpled again. What? There it is again. My father in Detroit. I've told him time and time again, I don't like a messy paper. Look at that. No selector control yet. All the way to Earth. You can see the whole room, the goldfish bowl, the, the antimacassars on the chairs. Yet we can't pick up something less than a mile away. Knock it off, Hal. We're wasting time. Come on. That gadget won't work. We'll have to comb these rooms inch by inch. I don't understand. Neither do I. We'll cut behind the hood here and go on. Briggs, you take the lead with the radiation ticker. We might be able to pick up a reading on where the rocket fuel is hidden. Aye, sir. All right, let's go. I can't understand why that machine can pick up earth and not... Help, help, Captain! Briggs, what is it? Captain, help! I'm falling! It's a cave-in. Hang on, Briggs! I'm... Slipping, Captain. Grab his wrist. All right. Now Got pull. It. Pull. Uh, higher. Higher. Uh, higher. Uh, what happened? I was just walking along and the ground caved in. What? It's some kind of shaft. Hold your light over it, Captain. Oh! Fifty feet deep in a stone bottom. I could have split my head open like a grapefruit. Something down there. Hold that light steady. Amazing. Amazing. Looks like a pile of bones to me. Two piles. They may be the first skeletal remains ever found of the lost race. I've got to get down in there. We haven't got time, Howell. Come on. Let me have your binoculars. Wonderful. That small skeleton must be an infant. They've been laid out carefully at the burial chamber. The way they're lying, it's probably a mother and infant. Yeah. The tail. She's definitely anthropoid. Howell, you... You mean apes? Something like that. Yet they had atomic power and built cities across the galaxy. Amazing. Oh, we haven't got time. Hello, that's funny. The, the little one is different. The, 
The caudal bones are different. No tail. Listen, Hal. What do I care whether they had tails or not? Come on now. It's almost as if... Well, they, they, they did have atomics, and radiation does funny things to heredity. They had that problem with mutations in Detroit. What? Detroit? That must be it. What? The new atomics plant at Detroit. They tore down my father's house to make room for it. Quickly, Captain. Oh, where are you going? Back to the machine. I've got a theory that may solve the whole mystery of what happened to the lost race. I don't care what happened to the dead ones, Hal. I want to find the living ones who wrecked my ship. I think this machine may give us both answers. There's the house, Detroit, down to the last detail. Oh, come on down. We know all but that. But don't you understand? That house was torn down. I got a letter before we lifted off Earth. It's gone. But it's on the television machine. Captain, that machine isn't television. It's a thought projector. What? It only mirrors what's in your own mind. But, Mr. Howell, we saw Earth. It was really there. But it was just because we imagined it, Briggs. It's a thought projection. I can produce any mental image that occurs to me on this machine. New York, spaceport, a space guard patrol, anything. Anything? Yes. And now I think I know what inspired the lost race to do what they did. It was fear. Fear of what was in their own minds. They could all see it with machines like this. But fear? Fear of what? They foresaw the future. So they destroyed themselves. Every last one of them. All it, how. Are you sure they're all dead? 100,000 years ago. Then who blew up the ship and stole our lifeboat? Danton. Danton? But why? He was pathologically jealous. Yes, but blowing up the ship was like committing suicide. He wasn't crazy enough to do that. The lost race was after they looked at this machine. You mean Danton did too? We found his wrench here. You're right. He must have looked at the machine and thought it was television. He must have seen all his fears about losing his girl confirmed. That was enough to make him completely unbalanced. But he was with Kelly when that explosion went off. He's got an ironclad alibi. No, he hasn't. It wouldn't take a power man long to sneak back to the ship and rig a delayed action fuse. Howell, we've got to get back to the ship before Danton. All right, Captain, stay right there. That's Danton. In the dark. You make a perfect target there. Stop your gun. I've got a blaster set at wide angle. Drop him. He's got his cold. I've been following you, Wharton. I wanted to tell you, I'm going back to Earth. I got the lifeboat hidden over that rise. It won't work in deep space. <laughs> you believe me when I told you that, didn't you? Well, I've got it fixed. And with that bacendium fuel, it'll be a milk run. I'll reach the space guard station at Volta with a long, sad story about how the rest of you exploded in mid-space. Danton, that's murder. Yeah, yeah, that's just what it is. And easy, too. Danton, you can't just leave us here. Watch me. Sit in front of that machine and watch me. Yeah, I know what it is. I know it's a television without a transmitter. And I did some checking up. I've seen how you were stealing my call. Trying to steal my girl. Stanton, you're sick. You Pretty can't... Pretty smart, pass- that lost race. They built some machine. And it showed me plenty. It showed me enough to kill you. Oh, you've got it all wrong. This isn't a television machine. What are you trying to pull, Wharton? I saw it. Those were your own thoughts, Stanton. Those things you saw exist only in your mind. Shut up before I blast all of you down. You're just trying to lie out of it, that's all. But I know the truth when I see it. And you're going to die. All right, Danton, but you're not going to get away with it. Look at the machine. What's that? The machine. It's the space guard patrol, Danton. Look, they're coming. X-3 to command. Spotted the Corellias reported. Preparing to land. That's the space guard, Danton. Yeah, whole patrol. You're lying, you're lying. They couldn't come. There wasn't any SOS. X-3 to command. Preparing to land. There's a clearing. That's enough, Howell. All right, Danton. They'll be coming over the horizon. Drop your gun and give yourself up. Oh, no. No, they're not going to catch me. I'll be away in that lifeboat before they land. Stay still, all of you. Stay where you are. I Danton. still got you covered. Danton, look out behind you. Ah! Burial shaft. He fell in it. Hold the light down, Briggs. Well? He's dead. Deader than the lost race. And what about those space guard cruisers? Out of my head. I just imagined them, and there they were on the machine. Poor Danton believed they were real. I wish they were real so we could get off this planet. No, it doesn't matter. We know where the lifeboat is now. We can send one man to bring back help. And it won't be Danton. The machine got him the same way it got the lost race. Through fear. 
But what was the lost race afraid of, Howell? Changing. Changing? Look at those skeletons down there. They had atomic energy, but they couldn't control it. Look, the baby is different from the other. The race was changing by mutation. Mutation? Look at those skeletons. Now imagine a shifted hip socket so they could walk upright. The baby was already without a tail. But how? That would mean they were changing into... Into... Yes, Captain. The lost race committed suicide rather than face the fear of seeing their descendants become such horrible creatures as men. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. And now, about next week. William Travis and his wife thought they had escaped. But they were wrong. They were being searched out by men from another world. Men who wanted them to return. Where? I'll tell you next week. Tonight's drama was based on the Murray Leinster story, The Lost, and was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Matt Crowley as Captain Wharton, Roger DeCoven as Howell, and Joseph Julian as Danton. Your host was Norman Rose. That was a well-written and well-acted episode. Dimension X did a really good job of adapting stories from the sci-fi pulp magazines. Ernest Canoy did most of these. He wrote scripts for many of the major NBC radio and television dramas of the 1950s. Now, I tried to find the origin of our story, but alas, I could find no record of a book or short story that matched. The author didn't show up either which suggests that Murray Linkster was probably a pen name. Dimension X was a very effective demonstration of what could be done with science fiction on the air. The problem was is that it came so late in the golden age of radio that nobody cared. However, some of the stories stand as classics of the medium. For example, Bradbury's Mars is Heaven is as gripping today as when you first heard it on the show. And his Martian Chronicles was one of the series' most impressive offerings. You can listen to that one on episode number 503 of Ron's Amazing Stories. In fact, you can listen to all of the remaining episodes of Dimension X on the Internet Archive. And so ends episode number 626. My thanks go out to Jake Waters, Rich Snyder, and Lowell Rice for their stories and contributions to this one. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.